Birds of Play has always been a show focused on conversations, but certain topics can be hard to explain and discuss without making our episodes two hours or longer. Starting this week, we're taking a more in-depth look at the issues and questions in the gaming and tech industry that require more than a simple yay or nay response. For this inaugural entry into the series, I want to pose a question for you. Do you need to be good at video games to be a games journalist? Now, while citing Wikipedia is normally a deadly sin for journalists, for today's purposes, I'm going to pull a quote from the site that seems to accurately describe modern-day games journalism. The quote reads, Video games journalism is a branch of journalism concerned with the reporting and discussion of video games. It is typically based on a core reveal, preview, and review cycle. Through this cycle, games journalism differs heavily from, say, the job of a police reporter or just a regular newsroom editor. Where the journalists at your local paper or on the morning news are supposed to present stories with as little bias as possible, the nature of games journalism requires a subjective take on much of what is happening. When a new Call of Duty game is announced, you can't simply quote a press release or post a link to the trailer and end your coverage there. Analysis of hype and excitement surrounding the game setting, cast, and overall look is much of what readers look for in the coverage, along with developer interviews and early gameplay footage, if it's available. Whether gamers want to admit it or not, the reveal, preview, review cycle gets more clicks than almost anything else on gaming sites. Well, besides the top 10 hottest female video game characters list. I'm looking at you, Watch Mojo. Oh, is that an ancient Tibetan ritual dagger in your pocket? Oh, maybe I'm just happy to see you. Hmm. <sighs> yeah, hello. Today we'll be counting down our picks for the top 10 sexiest video game characters. So where does this leave the definition of games journalists in relation to their ability to cover announcements, play, and subsequently review games? How good do you need to be at video games in order to be a critic of them? The answers to these questions aren't at all straightforward. As much as it may feel like a cop-out to say, these questions are best answered on a case-by-case -case basis. Before going into the more notorious and recent examples of journalists playing games poorly, let me begin with my personal anecdote. I love racing games. Kart racers like Mario Kart, arcade-style games like Need for Speed, driving simulators like Gran Turismo, and the games that fall somewhere between arcade and sim like the Forza series all interest me, and some have even motivated me to buy a console. I jumped at the opportunity to buy a Nintendo Switch when Mario Kart 8 Deluxe released, and more recently purchased an Xbox One S in order to play Forza Horizon 3 after my go-to racer, Gran Turismo, released a lackluster entry for the franchise in the form of GT Sport. I love racing games, but rarely am I good at them. I infrequently place last in online racers, but first place finishes are equally as sparse. Compare this to first person shooters, where I often finish top of the leaderboard in multiplayer matches, and feel the need to bump up campaign difficulties when available. Does my skill in FPS games make me more qualified to review those games than racing games, despite my equal time spent in both genres? I don't believe so. Here's where the argument of competence over pure skill comes into play. No one who reviewed Overwatch for one of the big name sites like IGN or GameSpot is a professional Overwatch League player, and most of the reviewers for indie platformers will never become world record holding speedrunners, but we trust their reviews. We don't ask food reviewers to be professional chefs, or game reviewers to be such experts on a game that they know the inside and out of the development process. Most consumers and readers of reviews are people simply looking for an insight or perspective that can help them make an informed purchasing decision. Sometimes I want to read a review for someone who has played every entry of the franchise. That way comparisons between the newest entry and games past can be made. This is especially helpful with annualized franchises such as sports games and Call of Duty. Other times I want a fresh perspective for when I'm jumping into a franchise or genre for the first time and have no nostalgia or experience with the series. What does the new Assassin's Creed game feel like to someone who never played the past games? This perspective can be seen as more important to the consumer who has little to no experience with the series. Your history playing a genre or franchise does not make a review intrinsically more valuable over someone else who is a rookie to that genre or franchise. The value of a review should be determined by factors like the perspective it offers, the value it adds to the reader or consumer of the content, and the unique take or entertainment it displays. As I stated earlier, Games journalism and games reviews are inherently subjective. My excitement for a new entry in the Dark Souls franchise, a series I've played at most for two hours, won't match my excitement for a new Grand Theft Auto game, a franchise I've literally poured months of my life into. I'd be a lot better suited to hypothetically cover, preview, and review Grand Theft Auto 6 than Dark Souls 4. But this doesn't mean I'm unable to cover certain games. It just means I may not be the first choice to review the next Dark Souls. Now to address the examples that have had gamers up in arms in recent months. These begin with Dean Takahashi's Cuphead video, and more recently, the Kotaku article by Ethan Gotch. 
Takahashi's 26 minutes of inept and poor gameplay, including an utter disregard for tutorial instructions, set the gaming world on fire and reignited the very debate this piece is focusing on. And just as the storm had settled down, Ethan Gox suggested that difficulty menus like those found in Wolfenstein 2 administer an insidious kind of peer pressure to play at higher difficulties. Is Cuphead difficult? According to everyone I've talked to since its launch, yes, the game is difficult. Did I personally have to replay one section of Wolfenstein 2 28 times to advance? Also, yes. Do either of these points validate what Takahashi and Gok had to say? Not at all. Should Takahashi have received so much scorn from the gaming community for his objectively terrible gameplay preview? Should Gok be scolded for his opinion on difficulty menu guilt trips? Those answers depend on whether or not you have the common sense to see a game preview or opinion article as ridiculous as Takahashi's or Gok's and decide to harass and troll a man, or simply move on and find other sources for information and entertainment. If a gaming website or a certain journalist's opinions heavily differ from yours in a consistent manner, I don't see why simply finding another reporter or website isn't an option. This isn't my way of inviting you to close off discussions where thoughts may differ from your own. What I'm saying is that there are literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of voices in games journalism, at websites big and small. Find those that you identify and agree with most, and find a handful of journalists you wholeheartedly trust. So do games journalists need to be good at video games to be considered a professional critic? Let me answer that question with a simile. Games journalism should be like a well-balanced esports title. Easy to learn, but difficult to master. The best games critics have a wealth of experience in both writing and gameplay under their belt. I personally value competence at playing a game over traditional skill when it comes to reviews. But games journalists overall need to do a better job of addressing their audience in previews and reviews. My game reviews are catered to a young adult or older audience. I don't expect many preteens to be searching the internet for articles from someone who writes about how a game can change your political ideology, or how collector's editions need to improve. So when I say Super Mario Odyssey is inhibited because of its lack of difficulty, I'm not saying that the game isn't possibly at the near perfect level of difficulty for a 10 year old. What I am saying is that for my audience, those with a decent amount of experience with platformers, Super Mario Odyssey's lack of challenge often left me bored, and I believe it will leave them at least somewhat bored as well. I think many big websites have lost the desire to cater to what people want to read. Focusing on what is so outrageous or out of the ordinary will certainly get clicks at that moment, but at what long-term cost? Integrity? Future website traffic? No one cares that you were offended by the difficulty slider calling you a baby for playing on super easy especially in a notoriously brutal and bombastic franchise like Wolfenstein. In my opinion, there's nothing wrong with sucking at video games. There's also nothing wrong with reviewing a game you find yourself to be particularly bad at. But don't call a game unplayable or the hardest thing you've ever experienced just because you failed to read the tutorial screen or because the moveset and levels take longer than normal to master. Some games will be more difficult than others. As a games journalist, admit your shortcomings. Briefly address those shortcomings in previews and reviews for games you struggled with and move on with your analysis. It's just common sense. Whether you agreed or disagreed with what we had to say, please let us know your opinions down in the comments below. Leave us a like as it really does help us out, and be sure to stay tuned for future entries into the series. Thank you for watching.